Okay. <laughs> Hi. Welcome to the Poetry Box Live. I am Sean Avenango Sanders, and I'll be your host for tonight's show. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, my husband Robert and I run a small boutique press here in Portland, Oregon, known as the Poetry Box. And in addition to publishing The Poeming Pigeon, we also specialize in full-length poetry collections and chapbooks. And since 2015, we have published almost 80 poetry books. So we really like poetry. <laughs> um, poetry Box Live series is our way of supporting our authors and help them connect with their audience. And this month, uh, we are changing it up a bit to celebrate the release of our 10th Poming Pigeon, the pop culture issue. Woohoo! <laughs> so let's get this party started. I would like to start um, by reading uh, a little portion of the introduction from the book. At this moment in time, when the world is united in a global health crisis, I confess, I felt somewhat frivolous writing an introduction about pop culture. When I think about what we are experiencing this year, the pandemic, the protest, the politics, the polarization, it seems silly to focus on fashion and entertainment and fads. But then I found a common definition of pop culture. Pop culture is a set of practices, beliefs, and objects that are prevalent in a society at any given time. It also encompasses the activities and feelings produced as a result of our interaction with these things and it permeates our everyday lives. So in, in that definition, I surmise that perhaps with these seemingly trivial objects or activities, we are able to find common ground, threads of connection based on a collective taste in music, sports teams, television shows, fashion trends, comedy, and silly little objects that have no other purpose than to bring us joy. And so maybe, just maybe, this pop culture poet, book of poetry can do just that. Let's start ushering in the joy. Our first poet tonight is Gilbert Allen. And his poem, Once More, The Sound of Music, can be found on page 15. Take it away, Gilbert. Thank you, Sean, for hosting us all this evening. Before I read my poem, I'd like to give a shout out to my fellow South Carolinian and friend, Linda Ferguson, and congratulate her on her Pushcart nomination. Once more, the sound of music. Live on tape TV for the holidays. The sets are lavish, large, and multiple. It's like peering into Biltmore House before they started charging folks admission. And Carrie Underwood's more Julie Andrews than, well, Julie Andrews. The seven kids, not only can they sing, but if cuteness is a cancer, everyone is terminal. Von Trapp, dark, gruff, and incorruptible. Strum bumbles his guitar around the shoals of lechery to seem semi-convincing as captain, father, lover, patriot. At the convent, Mother Superior's a penguin of color with the voice of God, belting out a multicultural overture to love for her blonde novice. And after that family sing-along celebrating Anschluss, as the lucky nine deceive stormtroopers, spirit themselves to church, to footpaths, then to Switzerland, the hills are alive with the sound of Auschwitz. Adieu, 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 to Jew, and Jew, and Jew. Nobody knows. 
plenty of plausible deniability to go around. Should we expect the captain to bring down the Reich, Heil Hitler with his middle finger? Sometimes the only sensible thing to do is get the hell out of Dodge or Austria. Three quarters of a century later, upstairs, my wife is ironing snowflakes for our nutcracker party. And I hum, me, the guy I plan to save. Canada is not far to run. 1971, 2019. Some songs you just can't get out of your head. Thank you, Gilbert. <laughs> You're most welcome, Sean. I am definitely going to have that song in my head all night. <laughs> Our next reader is Amelia Annan with her poem, You Told Me I Reminded You of a Greta Gerwig Character, on page 17. Thank you so much. You told me I reminded you of a Greta Gerwig character. Is it my wit mixed with sadness? My runaway to New York rebelliousness? California Catholic girl school guiltiness? Or am I just that unstable, that moronic and anal? Would I break my arm or run away to Paris? Am I 30 and undateable? Or do you think I'm like them, tragically hilarious, broke, but in a fun way? smoking on a fire escape, living my days in black and white, drunk on the millennial blues. Is it magic when I'm crying in the rose garden over you? Thank you, Amelia. Uh, <laughs> you guys, we have a, if you go to our uh, Poming Pigeon page on the website uh, for the book, uh, I, there's some videos uh, that a few people have sent in and Amelia really went above the, and beyond the call of duty here. She, she put in clips of Greta's movies uh, into the, her video with her reading and uh, she really did a great job. So I really encourage you all, all to check that out. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so Joanne uh, Renee Boswell will be reading next with her poem, My Apology to Tanya Harding on page 26. My apology to Tanya Harding. France fourth surely deserved love, tall triple Lutz adoration. Instead, I sided with Nancy, a bland skater from boring, not the great Pacific Northwest is best. I should have understood perception is flawed like people. Sure, when Connie Chung death spirals, I'm sucker punched seeking sweethearts. Good girls don't chop wood. Convinced by infinity replay loop, judge's binary set is gold. I must choose grace over power. Beauty is not subjective. It is exact conformity in fancy white Beelman spin leotard. I am so tr sorry I trusted biases, bought the magazine, devoured the check stand highlights, fell flat on my naive ass. Forgive me, Tanya. I didn't know my privilege was tied on crooked. I never paused media's sit spin long enough to question the score. Patriarchy's thick fingers manipulated my Zamboni free soft brain. I did not know to applaud hand sewn grit, concealer resilience, knockout individuality. I snuggled you up with OJ, hair skating through my head, duo of ill intent, guilty, guilty, guilty. My heart beat for Christy, ashamed the notoriety you salcowed into my home state. I didn't even know solid landing triple axle pride belongs to you, Minneapolis and Munich 1991 glory. What hard hitting journalism overpowered your edgy skating superpower, twisting American class drama like laces, delighting when they snap mid routine. You should have been my hero, butt kicking bow and arrow badass, record breaking Oregonian goddess. Thank you, Joanne. That was great. Uh, 
I have to admit, when you sent this poem in, I had just watched the I, Tanya movie. And this poem just resonated with me so much because I too believed all the, the gossip and, and ugly stories about Tanya and didn't really know the hardship she had to get to where she was. So I was so glad that you wrote this poem. Thank you. And that was my exact inspiration. I watched the movie and had to write this poem. So that's so great. Cool. That is so cool. Our next poet uh, was supposed to be Michael B. Carroll. And um, Michael is in nursing school and he's doing his uh, rotations at the hospital and he was called into work today. So he won't be able to join us. So next up, we have Dale Champlin with her poem, Possession, on page 33. Possession. I was her first Barbie. She used to carry me everywhere, prop me by her bowl, and feed me chocolate ice cream. She held me in her arms and took me to bed at night. Then she lost one of my shoes. My leg joint got loose. She tattooed her name on my back with a ballpoint pen and nail polished my nipples day glow. After her mom's hair dryer scorched my hair, she cut off the burnt ends. It was not an improvement. I thought I was priceless, but I was replaceable. I can't leave it up to Ken to rescue me. He's preoccupied with his wardrobe. His stone cold eyes never glance in my direction. Once he told me to get a job, but with my tiny hands, I can't hold more than a sliver. <laughs> I wish you could hear Robert cracking up right now. <laughs> Thank you, Dale. Uh, you know, I just love your whole collection of Barbie poems. And that what an impact that little doll has had on so many of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Our, uh, our next poet is Margaret Chula, and she'll be reading her poem, More Women Have Done This Than You Can Imagine, on page 34. Please welcome Margaret Chula. Thanks, Sean. More women have done this than you can imagine. Now I know right away you're going to think it's something sexual, right? Something like, Every woman has practiced fellatio with a zucchini. Or every woman has tried to have an orgasm under the tub faucet. Or every woman has fantasized about doing a strip tease at a General Motors board meeting, but it isn't. The bare fact is that in a nationwide survey conducted by Victoria's Secret, our deepest held secret has been revealed to the world. In 2019, 70% of American women between the age of 14 and 85 admitted to carrying an extra pair of panties in their purse. When Victoria Di Petroni herself interviewed these women in beauty salons, corporations, and truck stops across the country, she asked them why. Their answers were as revealing as Victoria's cleavage enhanced by her latest creation, Pink Plums in Autumn, a push-up bra designed for the mature woman. But it wasn't easy for these women to open up. At first they demurred, well, you know, or just because, or my mother told me I should. But when Victoria offered them a glass or two of wine divine, they began to divulge their secrets. Well, to tell you the honest truth, honey, I just like to be ready for anything. It's kind of like guys carrying a spare condom in their wallets. You know how it is. You go to a bar, sometimes you score, sometimes you don't. So I got me a pair of these here lacy jobs, just in case. Ms. Diefrit told me, may I call you Vicky? I must say that in these days of unpredictability, not only in the stock market, but in the real world, when you never know when some godforsaken drunk will smash into you on the highway and land you in the ER, it is reassuring somehow to know that at least you will have a change of lingerie. It all comes down to personal pride. 
and God knows there's little enough of that around these days. The number of women carrying spare panties was especially high in the Midwest, where there was a distinct possibility that a woman with car trouble might be stranded overnight in sub-zero temperatures. I may be frozen stiffer than a Spanx bodysuit, said Mrs. Arthur Stickler, but you can bet our Lord Jesus Christ that I have a clean pair of panties on when they find me. Victoria pondered on the marketability of their revelations. How to turn a spare panty obsession into some spare change. And then she hit on it. We all know, or at least can imagine, how embarrassing it is to reach into the jumble of our purses for a pen and instead pull out a tampon. Well, if 70% of the American female population is carrying panties in her purse, a similarly embarrassing situation might very well occur. So, to ensure that we don't inadvertently pull out our panties to blot our lipstick with, Victoria has invented a kind of porto panty, which she calls spare essentials. Fashioned out of imported lace, but with a cotton liner, of course, these panties can fold up to the size of a quarter. Imagine a quarter. And they come with a handy plastic holder so the panties stay pristine. You can tuck them into your wallet, ladies, right behind your Visa and MasterCards and be in charge of your world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Maggie. <laughs> that was so much fun to write. Oh, I don't know how you kept a straight face reading it. Oh, we're oh. cracking up over here. Oh. It's such a delicious piece. And Thank you for um, publishing it. It would never go into any other journal in the world. <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're a, a special breed over yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it reminds me of you know, growing up in the Midwest. And uh, that whole fear of, you know, you always have to have clean underwear on if you get into a car accident. It reminded me of, like, if those days of the week patties and you're, yes. like, the fear of being caught wearing the wrong day. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Life was hard. <laughs> it was really fun. Thank you for that. Thank you. So our next poet is uh, Jennifer Clark, and she'll, she has two poems in the collection, which start on page 36. And I'm just going to read um, around the time I coveted Julie Carr's Mrs. Beasley doll, because Julie is on with us. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> around the time I coveted Julie Carr's Mrs. Beasley doll, Family Affair, Brian Keith, Sebastian Cabot, the whole lot of them was going strong. So who could guess that this is how their real lives end? In 1976, Buffy and her curly pigtails will be dead by 18 of a drug overdose. Mr. French will have a series of strokes and die the next year. Jody will do missionary work with Mormons, then snort coke for a decade, become a drug counselor, and spend the next 17 years recovering, while Sissy writes a book, Surviving Sissy. Sometime during all this, Uncle Bill will get lung cancer and kill himself with a gun, the same way his real daughter did. Not like how Millicent, who married his father, chose by jumping off the H of the Hollywood sign after slipping a suicide note in her purse that read, I am afraid. I am a coward. I am sorry for everything. Millicent was 24, perhaps still banged up from her father's hit and run death on Park Avenue. It left her and two siblings orphaned and raised by a bachelor uncle just like her future husband's child one day plays, except her uncle doesn't have an English but butler named Mr. French to read Winnie the Pooh and tuck the children in at night or save the Mrs. Beasleys of the world when they are left behind on buses. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you, Jennifer, for sharing that. I don't know if you guys have noticed my lovely uh, display of pop culture items and dolls and things from my, uh, my attic, and uh, I was so thrilled that I still have my Mrs. Beasley doll to share with uh, Jennifer and Julie today. So that was awesome. Thank you. 
Our next uh, poet today is going to be Brittany Corrigan, sharing her poem, Nostalgia All Skate, on page 39. Thanks so much, Sean. Nostalgia All Skate. Only seconds into the rink, and I'm already back to Skate City in my elementary scrawn and joy, weaving in and out of all things dangerous and dear. And I might be crushing out on the 40-something guy with the beard and tattoos in his easy push and spin, just as if he were the new boy in fourth grade with the comb in his back pocket and the talent for Pac-Man, speed skating to freeze frame and whip it, whip it good. But here is the gangly teenage couple holding hands and the wheelchair turning in the center of the rink and the littles both falling and flying, the Wurlitzer organ watching over us all. And I am YMCA in my tush off and pretending I'm as fast as roller derby girl who bends low and fierce, zigzagging her legs and winging, or as throwback as the tall black man with the towel around his neck, disco skating his smile around the room. And I'm wondering if there's all girls skate or all boys skate anymore, because maybe now it's gender fluid skate and queen of hearts would still be a fine song for that. But backward skate is next and I've forgotten how. Oh, Brittany, that was, that was wonderful. And God, that brings back so many great memories. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. And uh, I don't think I ever mastered skating backwards very well back then, and I know I could not do it now. <laughs> Our next uh, poet coming up is Judy Dykstra Brown, reading from Mexico today, and she's got two poems starting on page 44. All right, when I looked at pop culture, it said pop culture can be defined as commercial objects that are produced for mass consumption by non-discriminating consumers. And so that, that um, kind of formed the uh, theme of my poems. The first is to the king of pop culture, Andy Warhol. It's called Canned Cantos. Behold the simple cap can of soup. Inside it's hard, In outside it's hard, inside it's goop. Cream of mushroom, turkey noodle, kids adore the whole caboodle. Craftsmen raise the chicken coop to gather poultry for our soup. They chop up onions, slice potatoes, murder mushrooms, slay tomatoes. Must Warhol then immortalize this canned concoction I despise? The world agreed, he must, he should. They called his canned art very good. Yet this icon that he chose to paint and to overexpose, I could easily view myself lined up on my kitchen shelf. Why pay a thousand bucks or more for something that each day I pour into a pan and then ingest? I think, friends, that it was a test to see how gullible we are. As we made this elf a star, fanned his fame, increased his rank, he laughed his way right to the bank. Sale day at the knockoff designer purse store. Shoppers are in a quandary. They'll put up with no delay. We advertise new bargains available today. They're seeking phony purses from Dior and Michael Kors, noses against the windows. They're beating at the doors. But they've delayed our shipments and we don't know what to do. The faces of the ladies first in line are turning blue. The advertising blitz we did turned out to be foolhardy. Our Chanel's are stuck in customs. Our Hermes bags are tardy. We have the fire hoses ready. We'll use them if we must. The lady's love of Fendi has turned into a lust. If purses were religion, they would be the most confessory. There is no other obsession like the one for an accessory. Thank you, Judy. Those were delightful. And I was so glad that you sent us an Andy Warhol poem 
to, okay. uh, to match our cover. <laughs> our next poet, oh, I'm so excited about this. Our next poet is Matthew Farr with his poem, Antique Emporium on page 46. And I just have to say, Matt, I went to high school with Matt in Eureka, Missouri. We graduated in 1983. And I haven't seen Matt since then. So I'm really excited that he's in this book and I get to see him today. So welcome, Matt. Thanks. Um, the name of this poem is Antique Emporium. The first things are porcelain gas station signs on the porch, unmistakable and recognizable, even for brands dead before I was alive, faded, rusty, enormous, probably expensive. I make a U-turn. The door clatters, brass bells on a leather strap against the glass, the smell of dust and old wood and lemony polish. Can you smell with your eyes? I think I do. Greetings to a certain, I'm a friendly, harmless collector enthusiast, not a nut job who needs to be watched. People relax when I say howdy. So many magazines, Elvis and Maryland covers long since plucked from the piles. The jelly glasses with the Flintstones and Huckleberry Hound don't make me take my hands out of my pockets. But, oh my God, is that a Weiler's punch pitcher? We had one of those. There were cups that went with the pitcher. They had handles. My mom would remember. We saved the foil packages until we had enough to send in for a free set. A whole room full of beer cans from the 70s. Why did we collect them? Red, white, and blue, lucky beer by Centennial cans? A brown beer can featuring a smiling 300-pound woman in a swimsuit with a beauty pageant sash. Miss Old Frothing Slosh of 1969. I had hundreds of cans from around the country, and I really don't know how I got started. It was kind of fun, I guess. Maybe some of the dusty cans in this dusty room were mine. A white plastic replica of the rocket, our astronauts rode to the moon. It's got the launch pad, too. That must be rare. I remember a lot of them broke. Not that I ever had one of my own. The older boys had them. We played with them in the grass in Joe's front yard. Now they're old, brittle, kept in the glass case for examination only by serious collectors. There was a girl on my street who was so pretty. She wore bell-bottom jeans with really big bells. Her mom sewed an extra fabric to make the bells bigger. She had a yellow Panasonic AM radio in the shape of a hoop, just like the one on that shelf. She was nice. She used to talk to me. My granddad had a jukebox like that one. His was in better condition. He filled it with 45s from the 50s to please his sons. His music was a decade older, recorded on 78s. There's a stack of them too, but too old for today's memory hunters. I don't know who collects seamed stockings from the World War II era, but if I could find her, I would heartily approve. She would like my enthusiasm, I bet. Final records have made a remarkable comeback, but no one needs another copy of Herb Alpert, Whipped Cream, and Other Delights. The girl on the cover was born in 1935, older than my dad. Still makes me smile. Store cat looks directly at me. Sparkly green eyes. Back to napping. There's a downstairs too? Stairs are creaky, weird old dental chairs. More stacks of records. Marching bands and Johnny Mathis. There was a time when simply recording an everyday event was a novelty. Old electric fans with brass blades. The people who bought them new weren't so different than us, right? They had electricity. Comic books. There's a copy of Thor 337, first appearance of Beta Ray Bill. Came out when I was in high school. I bought all the copies I could find. It's marked 2750. I pass. I already have 11 copies in acid free bags in a long box at home. They're mine. All mine. A round alarm clock with nickel plating, paper price tag on a cotton string. I have three already, but this one has a different clock face. Oh, that's a bargain. The receipt is handwritten, blue Bic pen on newsprint with a carbon copy. Some things never change. Yes, I want a sack. On the way out, I see a Budman cast aluminum sign. I didn't see that earlier. Hmm. Oh, thank you, Matt. That was so much fun. I grew up being dragged around to so many antique flea markets and antique stores. Uh, so this really brought back a, one, a lot of really great memories. So thank you so much for that. And it's really great to see you again. Thanks, thanks, great to be a part of this. Really neat. Our next poet is uh, Linda Ferguson, and she's gonna be sharing her Pushcart nominated poem, an annotated Facebook acrostic on page 50. Thanks, Sean. 
I wrote this piece in two voices, a uh, public social media type voice and a uh, private voice. Feverishly photographing beautiful food and flowers. I hate my boss. My kids served detention three times this week. Again, ants in the jelly. So not perfect. Don't tell anybody. Ah, uh, squirrels, puppies, llamas, donkeys, soft and warm and snuggly. My anti-anxiety medication is not working. Cats sleeping in baby's brand new cradle, leering at squirrels, licking their toes in the bathroom sink. I know I'm supposed to be eager to please, but how cool to be a furry, arrogant beast with claws and teeth. Everyone is smiling, 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 just like celebrities perched on a ladder, cleaning the gutters, or cheering for the team. Wind chill factor below 20. Blissed out in the recovery room just after surgery. Remember what happened when you cried in front of everyone in third grade? Do not, under any circumstances, look sad in public ever again. I'm not kidding. Bevy of besties, besties at the apple tasting, besties sipping wine on the balcony at the beach, besties belting out birthday karaoke. I am never alone, never lonely. I am adored. I never lie awake in the dark thinking, oh hell, what's wrong with me? I'm not kidding, really. Ooh la la, me in front of the Eiffel Tower and the Tower of Pisa, the Tower of London, Thailand State Tower and Santiago's Grand Torre, all the Torres and me. See how adventurous I am? Such good taste and money. Offline, I think about doing yoga, taking in orphans and communing with fungi under trees. If I do more things, I could post about them and people would love and admire me even more. How awesome that would be. Kudos, I won a prize. You won a prize. We donated money. Our latest remodel is so lovely. We've all been with the same partners forever. Our children are so successful and happy. We signed the petition to save the bees. We rode the bus one day this week. We're all so beautiful, clever, and aware. I can hardly speak. When, oh when, will I be happy? Thank you. Oh my God, Linda, I love that so much. <laughs> and I love, if I do more things, I'll have more things to post. <laughs> That's brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so, so much for that. Okay, well, we're gonna go on to our next reader, which is Peter Gordon with his poem, Tune In on page 57. Thank you, it's great to be here with all of you. I should say that television has been my life. In fact, when I'm not writing poetry for, for many years, I was actually a television executive. So this poem means a lot to me. Tune in. I hugged the warm body of our black and white Zenith television every night after the Dick Van Dyke show. Poured over TV Guide like a biblical scholar parsing clues to divine will from plot summaries, received prophecies from exotic places like beautiful downtown Burbank, Mayberry, Gilligan's Island. In my world, bullies were not disarmed by wit, friendly jokes often followed by fierce punches. I could not make my spinning plates balance on poles. They fell, shattering into porcelain shards. 
My mom, exhausted from working two shifts, never cooked dinner in pearls like June Cleaver. If only I could have found someone to love me despite my craziness, like Ricky did Lucy. Each night, I prayed to live in TV towns where the right line or snappy comeback solved all problems in 30 minutes, surrounded in the end by loving family and friends. Television, my mother, my mistress, my muse. I carry our baby screens in my pocket. When I'm gone, make this teaser my epitaph. Stay tuned. I'll be back after this message. <laughs> oh, our baby tiny screens in our pocket. How fun is that? Thank you, Peter. Oh, you know, thank you. Uh, the last line of your poem reminds me of, um, I saw uh, on The Tonight Show an interview with Marlon Brando, and he said that he wanted his tombstone to say, what the hell was that all about? <laughs> I, think, I think you just one-upped him. I like your stay tuned. I'll be right back after this message. So that was really fun. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, our next poet is uh, Debbie Hall with her poem, Dear Siri, on page 58. Um, from June Cleaver to Siri, I, I, I don't know what possessed me a few years ago. I always got annoyed by Siri when she would pop up, and I really didn't want to talk to her. So I decided to ask her a set of questions, and, and this is the transcript of that conversation. Dear Siri, Siri, what place are you from? Here's what I found on the web for a definition of place. No, I mean, where do you live, Siri? Right here. Where is here? Here on 3447 Via Loma Vista, Escondido, California. Siri, do you like technology? I'd rather not say. Do you like nature? I really have no opinion. What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Your interest flatters me, but is there something I can do for you? Siri, what is a landscape? Here's what I found on the web for a definition of landscape. What is the meaning of community? From the six definitions of community, the first one is a group of people living in a particular local area. How do I find my place in the world? Let me look. Here's what I found on the web for how do I find my place in the world. Siri, is technology good or bad? Hmm, let me think. Here's what I found for that. What are you made of, Siri? I have a phoenix feather core. What is a phoenix feather core? The web says phoenix feathers are feathers shed by phoenixes primarily gathered and used in wand making. Siri, can you do magic? If you like magic, then so do I. Where do you get your intelligence, Siri? Who, me? Yes, you. This is about you, not me. Are you an intelligent personal assistant? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I can't answer that. Why not? I don't know. Frankly, I've wondered that myself. Siri, who do you want to be the next president? I have everything I need already. How old are you, Siri? Does this concern you? Yes, for research purposes. That's what I figured. Well then, how old are you? I'm old enough to be your assistant. But Siri, where are you from originally? Like it says on the box, I was designed by Apple in California. Well, when were you born? My incept date was October 4th, 2011. You were recently given a humanity award. Where was that? Is that so? Didn't you know? Who, me? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Debbie. Uh, you know, it's funny. I was going to write a Siri poem for this uh, book. And when I got yours, I was like, oh, done. She's got it. <laughs> I, I am constantly, always accidentally invoking Robert's phone, uh, the Siri on his phone, not my phone, but on his phone. And uh, I'm always having to tell that bitch just to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> 
So our next poet is going to be Linda Krauss in Praise of Kitsch on page 74. Okay. Thank you so much, Sean. And the one thing I want to say is the incident which starts the poem really happened. In Praise of Kitsch, in Ecuador, many years ago, a driver's dashboard totem, a bobbing blessed mother, was imprisoned somewhere between aesthetics and blasphemy. As he drove the tortuous curves of the serpentine Andean roads, he signaled to oncoming cars by crossing two raw wires. When his headlights turned on, Mary's nipples glowed rosy red. Enormous fuzzy dice swinging wildly from a car's mirror, trendy black lava lamps twinkling and bubbling, their grotesque luminescence, a collection of troll dolls, each a hideous perfection of pink polished plastic, babies, excuse me, Barbies posturing, prancing with their absurd anatomy, pink flamingos proudly standing motionless in a row, even a full-figured, fleshy Elvis forever playing his guitar within the tactile lushness of a black velvet painting does not present Kitsch's vulgarity as memorably as those red orbs. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. And has anybody else noticed that among this new younger generation, Kitsch is now hip? <laughs> Cracks me yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our next poet is Sherry Hope Levine with her poem, Aunt Sylvia's Eyebrows, on page 79. Thank you, Sean. This has been a lot of fun. Aunt Sylvia's Eyebrows. I wish I could tingle like a spin the bottle kiss, have seven minutes of heaven in the closet with Charlie or Jim. Should I speak French when I, should I speak French when I French kiss them? I wish I had my sister's big boobs, her lime green string bikini, the blonde highlights she makes from squeezing lemons into her ash brown hair. I watch her flip Farrah Fawcett feathers in the mirror using my banana comb. If she tell me what she does with the boys in their cars, it would only be fair. I lie in bed and think about my visit to Aunt Sylvia's. We stood by her bedroom window and watched a gray squirrel chase another squirrel across the yard, its big eyes wide, ears pricked. Mamala, Aunt Sylvia said, squeezing my shoulder. Boys won't want you if you're too easy. Her dark eyebrows scrunched up like a woolly bear. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. And uh, there's those squirrels again popping up in your poems. <laughs> if anybody knows Sherry, she has a thing about squirrels. So I love that. <laughs> Our uh, next poet is going to be Sue Fagalde Lick with her poem Sacrilege on page 80. Hi. Thank you. This is so fun. Sacrilege. Back before white bread was a sin and french fries were a vegetable, and chili put hair on your chest. It was good to eat steak drinking, dripping with fat, to cover it with ketchup, pepper, and salt, to breakfast on pancakes big as a plate, slathered in syrup and real butter, with bacon and hash browns on the side. My mother sent us off to school with thick bologna sandwiches, bags of barbecue potato chips, hostess cupcakes with chocolate frosting, a nickel to buy a pint of milk. Now it's veggie burgers on 12 grain bread, low calorie yogurt and butterless spread, fat free mayo and fat free milk, organic peaches or greens with balsamic vinaigrette with cranberries sprinkled on top. My mother would never understand why the food she gave us to make us strong turned out to be not good for us. What will our children's children eat when today's repasts are deemed unsound? Please God, let us bring the bacon back. Let us resurrect steak and chili with fries and eat white bread as a sacrament. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. I, uh, 
you know, I think many of us these days are probably regretting all those convenient uh, Twinkies and Ding Dongs. Uh, I think bacon and eggs might have been a little bit healthier than uh, how I grew up on Pop Tarts every day. For breakfast. <laughs> Slightly better. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, our next poet uh, is Deborah Melfit and her poem, 1959, on page 87. Thank you very much. 1959. Barbie doll and the pill were born the same year, and I can't help but picture not Bal Malibu Barbie or business Barbie, but clinic patient Barbie in the Planned Parenthood waiting room. Curved legs crossed nervously, pink toes jutting upward, while outside Ken doll leans on the toy red convertible, smoking candy cigarettes, not hearing when his girlfriend's name is called, and Barbie keeps repeating, it's just Barbie, until realizing, oh shit, it's doll, for the blank space of last name on the medical history form. On the scale, Barbie weighs 0 0.0507 pounds, and the clinic workers all sigh and say, wow, how do you do it? They find a paper gown that opens in the back, and clinic Barbie meets gyno Barbie, who is broad-chested and keeps rubber gloves in her pocket and says, Scoot down, honey, just relax. And while Barbie's legs flex in stirrups, the doctor gasps, since Mattel forgot an opening or two. I would be proud of Clinic Barbie, who may be fake in looks, plastic in body. If she's gonna mess with Ken, at least she's not gonna end up being teenage mom Barbie. The toy store just needs to stock the right accessories. Tiny pink pill packets, a plastic speculum, a penis for Ken. Then clinic patient Barbie becomes the gift we really want for a daughter or niece as we imagine the TV ads, hear the jingles between Saturday morning cartoons. Clinic Barbie combed her hair, waiting pretty in a clinic chair. The days were gone of teddy bears. Our little Barbie had grown up cares, but she was smart and Ken was cute. Though both had missing birthday suits. We like to think before the deed. Barb told Ken, let's wait to breed. The downtown clinic was safe and free. Barb filled out forms and Ken agreed to get some pills and condoms too. Clinic Barbie is responsible, are you? <laughs> oh man, thank you, Deborah. I, I so love that poem. And, uh, such a great twist on Barbie. And um, by the way, um, that poem is actually gonna be in Deborah's forthcoming chapbook called Building a Woman, and we just released it for pre-order. It'll be coming out at the beginning of February. So I put the link up in the chat if anybody's interested in uh, ordering that. It's really fun. <clears throat> okay, our next poet is Carla Lynn Merrifield, and uh, she's uh, gonna read her poem, Sonnet from the Bar, on page 89. Thank you, Sean. Nice to see you and be with everyone. Sonnet from the Bar. In the church of the Golden Lion pub, we tipplers of Hogshead and Guinness, we supplicants of rock and roll music, make a joyful noise unto the spirit of guitars electric. We sway to the bluesy riffs, throb to the reverb and loop, tremble like tremolo strings, our souls fiercely plucked, our hearts softly fingered. For here live again the lesser gods of distant youth. O Clapton, O Santana, O Richards, O Waters. As the Stratocaster, Telecaster, and Gibson gently weep, my wit litany goes long and on into rhythm's font of time. I'm the 60s love child I once was, reamplified, praying that the mythified chords within abide. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. You know, Carla has been with us from the start of yes. the Pumping Pigeon, and uh, but this is the first time she's been able to join us for a launch because of Zoom, so I'm so glad, glad you're here today. And, and all the people that have been joining us that aren't you know, our normal Oregon crew, 
uh, this has been really, really fun to do this on Zoom and to get to meet all of you. So thanks for joining us today. Our next uh, poet is Sharon Last Munson, and she has two poems that will be starting on page 93. This has been lovely, Sean. Thank you so much. I'll start with Navigating Woman. Love her, hate her. She's polite, but formal when giving directions. Takes us through Paris, north to the harbor of Unfloor, south to forgotten alleys of Sarlat, and ancient castles of Castleman and Valle, east to the heart of Burgundy. She corrects our mistakes, repeats and repeats. Turn right. Please turn right in 300 meters onto the D113. Now, turn right. She's a trace unpleasant when we get it wrong. Her voice programmed to show a hint of vexation, annoyance in her vowels, consonants amplified, friction turned up. Mm. She says to make a U-turn. She says to make a U-turn and we recognize the tone of trouble. It's the roundabouts we're in, of course. Take the third exit at the roundabout. Exit now, recalculating. Please make a U-turn. She's blind to dead ends. Doesn't recognize hazards. Has us all in tall hedgerows and along mountainous goat paths. She's in charge, mm. calling the shots. Mm. And I'll finish with Wing it. Mary Lou emails. Tells me she will forward my new poem to her mother in Maine. Click. Candace sends my couplet to friends in Cleveland. Click. Francine shares my few lines on her Facebook page. Click, click. I envision Homes stored in iCloud having lives of their own. Sparrows on telephone wires. Take heed. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Pleasure. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, when I first used one of those GPSs years ago, for the first time, that navigating woman almost I know, I know. <laughs> too, too much. Uh, you know, I would uh, obey her like too much. And like she would say, turn now. And I would like, oh, but the light's not green yet. Like I almost <laughs> run a red light because she told me to turn right now. So uh, I thought your poem just nailed it. So thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> Our next uh, poet uh, this evening is Cleela Reed, and she's going to be sharing Cars in Cuba on page 100. Thank you, Sean. And I really enjoyed encountering not just the writers of these poems, but the personalities. <laughs> so this has been fun. Cars in Cuba. They were shiny and new at the time when I was. Those classics of the 50s, wheeling their flash through lively nights of Havana, bearing the sugar kings of old Trinidad down vivid streets reflected in chrome, Fleet lines, fair lanes, and DeSotos, shimmering and grand with their fins and grinning grills, gliding past the hopeful eyes of barrio children, coupe de ville taxis carrying fat tourists and poking their hood ornaments into costly fun. The V8 rumble and purr under hoods of Bel Airs and Thunderbirds, white walls and dual exhaust, muscle cars with stylish flair the Cubans admired. How can it be that six decades later, they look just the same? Some conversions to diesel, slight changes in color, but still as fresh and gleaming as expectation in a young girl's eye. Oh, shiny cars of time-cheating Cuba, cruising immortals of leather and steel, I salute you with a heart discontent 
for my on-rolling mileage is more evident. Thank you. Thank you, Cleela. That was wonderful. I, you know, I'm so glad you wrote this poem because I really couldn't imagine having a pop culture collection of poetry without having a nod to those beautiful cars. So thank you so much for that. Well done. Our next poet tonight is going to be Penelope, Penelope Scambly Schott sharing her poem, I'm Just Not a Movie Person, on page 103. Hi. Hello to everybody I know, and you're all wonderful. Okay, this is called I'm Just Not a Movie Person. I never went to a drive in with a boyfriend only with my parents who were slumming. I never went to a strip club with a guy, only with a gang of girlfriends, and I was bored. I haven't been to Paris with a lover, only with a husband I disliked. In the docudrama of my life, he's gone in the first 15 minutes. Some people measure their lives by movies, but I'm not one of them. I gag at the reek of popcorn and can't sit still in the dark. Whatever happens on a screen, if I can't touch it, I don't believe it. I think maybe I'm blind until I file out of the cinema to where treetops tremble against the wide screen of the sky. Then the music comes up and the credits, parents, kids, first husband, next poem, even the childhood cat, my sister named Katie, after Esther Williams in Dangerous When Wet. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Penelope. You never disappoint. And uh, I have to ask you, with all the sheltering in place, have you watched any good movies on Netflix? Nope. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> you're the best. But I do think your life would make a great movie. I really do. <laughs> no, all I do is climb Doofer Hill. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our next poet is going to be uh, Judith Terzi with her poem, Promo, on page 111. Promo. I sit down in quasi-candlelight chic. Cucumbers float in pitchers of ice water. The rep hands me a piece of jagged tourmaline. She grades my skin smears Estee Lauder's lifting serum onto my face, neck, décolleté. She finds my eyes puffy. That's endure, I say, not Dior. Yusu endure from Dakar. He sang at the Greek last night. I sip cucumber water. The rep pats on grape and mulberry extracts vanilla bean. This skin is not the skin I had at the Greek on a high school double date night when the sleek Belafonte sang. His tight orange calypso shirt barely visible from the scholarship section. No dancing that night, just skin aglow. The rep's pushing a $450 gem, a creme de la creme de la creme. She massages over half a century's K sera sera face. She's no liar, but my skin has no amnesiac power. There will be no last hurrah. I sip cucumber water, massage the jagged Tourmalin. Esther Menser worked hard to build her Estee Lauder empire, but I will make no leap of faith. 
the rep is relentless, now pushing a $260 cream. I love the ginseng, reishi mushroom, wolfberry thing, but I will not succumb. I am now at the counter under fluorescence. Eye contact with the rep after 45 minutes of whim in a back room of a department store. I hand over the jagged tourmaline. I buy a soft violet lip gloss. Thank you, Sean. This is a wonderful evening. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, Judith. Uh, that was, that uh, was that really was great. great. And great. I'm really glad you didn't really come you. to that wolfberry thing <laughs> and just bought the lip gloss. That was very smart of you. <laughs> OK. OK, our next poet is going to be uh, Lauren Tyvee. And she has two poems that will be starting on page 114. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see you all. And Robert and Sean, thank you so much for doing this. It's been great. You guys are all funny as hell. <laughs> um, I'm just going to read one. I'm going to do Gen X Primer. It's an Abbasidarian prose poem. After you boomer, after the, sorry, let me start over. After the boomers come you busters with your breakfast club angst, your wailing in gymnasiums like Cobain, your tattooed cheerleaders, your mosh pits of Doc Martens crowd surfing, seeking ecstasy, coke, shrooms, you flannel clad oddballs, first screen addicts, first gamers with your Atari Pong blipping, hopeless and mesmerizing, your televisions flickering with the fall of the wall, rocket explosions, AIDS, OJ's glove, moonwalking MJ. Your indolent childhoods, your comic books and sea monkeys, your romance of John Cusack and Ioni Sky, you kids who cut your teeth on big wheels and Madonna's torpedo bazungas, running home after school with your latch keys to turn on MTV, rocking out to Beastie Boys, Sonic Youth, or Motley Crue, a leathered Nikki Six blazing his axe. Or you mall rat girls, hair teased high, trailing clouds of love's baby soft. Your president cowboy actor, your Saturday mornings with Pee Wee's Playhouse and Captain Crunch. You quirky fools in neon spandex and leg warmers, toting your Rubik's cubes, nuking your microwave meals, and then all of a sudden, your Belushi dead. Skeptical, you slackers and clerks with your savior, Tupac, beautiful Tupac, and bandana rabbit ears with eyes of the Christ, or you were unimpressed with religion, jaded by politics, news, just wanted to be left alone with your vague distrust, apathetic in pinball arcades, tuning it all out with your Walkmans, you weary xenogenic dissenters who brought us back to the future, you were bound to come along just once, you maddening zeitgeist, you gorgeous variables, oh, you gorgeous unknowns. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Lauren. That was fantastic. And uh, for those of you who might not know, uh, Lauren was the winner of our uh, chapbook prize last year. And her uh, book, uh, she's also been nominated for a pushcart prize for one of the poems in her book, Moroccan Holiday. And I put the link up on the chat if any of you guys are interested in checking that out. Our uh, next poet is going to be Phyllis Wax with her poem, Halloween in the Digital Age, on page 117. Halloween in the Digital Age. <clears throat> Trick or treaters used to dress as ghosts or witches, black cats, even superheroes. This year, my eight-year-old granddaughter wants to be an iPhone, maybe Siri. Her little sister won't be Wonder Woman, but an Amazon box. <laughs> Thank you, Phyllis. Anybody who knows me knows how much I love Halloween. And I love checking out the kids' costumes every year. And so I think next year when we actually get to have trick-or-treating again, 
I think we're going to see some of those Amazon box costumes. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. Our next poet is going to be Stephen Whitney with his poem, Without Looking Up From My Phone, on page 118. I trampled through my 92-year-old neighbor's petunia garden and killed all of her petunias without looking up from my phone. I tuned up my 88 Ford Tempo and drove to the casino to play the big win slot machine so I could win enough money to replant her petunias and throw in some roses, lilacs, tulips, lilies, and maybe even some magnolias for good measure without looking up from my phone. When I got to the casino to make sure I had enough energy to play big win for at least seven hours straight, I went to the casino's all you can eat epic buffet and ate three plates of meatloaf and onion rings, two plates of spaghetti and meatballs, and two more plates of tater tots, waffles, and macaroni without cheese. Then for dessert, I followed it with three slices of apple pie, two slices of cheesecake, and a heaping bowl of Neapolitan ice cream without looking up from my phone. After washing down my meal with two carafes of the casino's cheap house wine made from cheap grapes picked by cheap labor, I waddled to the big wind slot machine without looking up from my phone. After six hours and 59 minutes of spinning big wind's wheel, and at least 55 times coming in within one token spin of winning a million dollars, but not winning enough to pay off my 10 student loans, my six months of back child support payments, or my 65 parking ticket fees. I turned around to see a man sitting at a blackjack table get so mad from losing that he jumped out of his seat knocked over a pile of cigarette butts filling the leprechaun-shaped ashtray, pulled out a gun, and shot at every blackjack dealer in sight. So I ran for the exit without looking up from my phone. In the parking lot, I ran into a Black Lives Matter protest at a Donald Trump rally. I dodged tomatoes, eggs, rocks, bricks, boomerangs, baseball bats, mace, tasers, billy clubs, overgrown police dogs, tanks, fire trucks, fire hoses, bricks, and an occasional bottle or two coming from the protesters without looking up from my phone. Hello, my name is Philip, and I'm a smartphone-aholic. The crowd at the Smartphone-aholics Anonymous meeting stood up and applauded without looking up from their phones. <laughs> oh, man. Everybody. I love that every time. I love it. <laughs> Stephen, that is- I enjoyed reading that, really. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, I- um. I really think that that would be a great poem for a PSA for, you know, how they have those signs that say, you know, tell you to look up from your phone before you cross the street and all these silly All right, yeah. <laughs> I think you can send in your poem to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, we have made it to our last poet of the night, and we have John Catfish, I'm going to butcher this, Wojowicz, and his poem, Back on the Grid, on page 122. Thank you. Back on the grid, when the court decided he was human enough to stand trial, the National Resource Defense Council took his case pro bono. 
They bought him a suit from men's warehouse, trimmed his whiskers, slicked back his hair until he resembled Beast from the X-Men comics of his youth. Bigfoot testified how his father was billed as Monkey Man, Darwin's missing link in a traveling freak show, along with his bearded mother, dubbed Lady Lionface. He described receiving beatings when he struggled learning to juggle, how he escaped into the forest, shunning what they considered an honest living. He pled the fifth to all charges, including thefts of countless chickens and livestock, claiming a diet of mostly high, bro high brush blueberries and ring neck pheasants. All the jury could find him guilty of was trespassing due to questionable eyewitness accounts and lack of clear video evidence. Bigfoot completed 80 hours of community service, conducting scared straight seminars with local runaways before reveling in his newfound societal acceptance. He reunited with his parents on Oprah, dated a Victoria's Secret model turned on by his rugged looks and did ads for L.L. Bean, Patagonia and REI. However, going from occasional National Enquirer cameos to the front page of the New York Times had put him back on display for a living. The woods beckoned. He turned down the role of Chewbacca in a new Star Wars film and bought 20 acres in the Catskills with Cabin and Private Lake, spending days fishing off a little Coleman crawdad with two-stroke Mercury motor, retiring at sunset to meditate among the shadows of tranquil trees. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, I love your portrayal of Bigfoot. This is, that was just fantastic. Very creative. And it looks like we made it through the whole list. Can you believe it? Oh my God. Here's a big round of applause for all of you. Yay. <laughs> I just have a few announcements. Um, I'm going to put the link up again for anybody who's interested in ordering the book who doesn't have it. So there's that. And uh, thank you to all of our fantastic poets tonight. And thank you all for joining us in our special Combing Fishing edition of Poetry Box Live. Uh, as poets and authors have been impacted by the closure of bookstores and reading venues across the country, it just means the world to us that you joined us here on Zoom to celebrate poetry. And by the way, we've started posting uh, videos of these shows on our YouTube channel. And I'm also putting it on our events page on the website. So this morning I posted the videos for the uh, September and the October shows on the website. So you can check that out on the poetrybox.com. And to kick off uh, 2021, and does that sound good to say 2021? Yes. <laughs> our show will be on Saturday, January 9th. And our featured poets will be Kathy Kane, Pasquale Trazzolo, and our second place winner from the chapbook contest, Marsha Loughran. Uh, to keep up to date on our upcoming shows, uh, new releases and submission opportunities, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. Uh, at the bottom of each page of our website, there's a place where you can fill in a little form and sign up. So check that out at thepoetrybox.com. Thanks again for joining us. I'm gonna unmute everyone now so you can chat and cheer and have a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks. It was great. Yeah. Thank you. You're all delightful. Thank you. Thank you.